And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hello everyone out there in Tampa Bay and beyond. This is James Knowles coming at you for the RBLR Sports Podcast. And I'm here tonight, not with my usual co-host, but instead with our producer, Eureka. So I will start how we usually do and say, Eureka, how are you doing tonight? It's a wonderful day in Tampa Bay. Uh, happy to be back. It's been a while, James, since you and I have, have yeah. sat down and talked green and gold. But of course, we talk green and gold. All those RBLR minutes that we do at halftime at Al Lang, they're beautiful. And now we kind of do a we do a whole hour. Uh, how about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to cover. Obviously, this past week, there were two games. We've not been able to get to those yet. But yeah, um, yeah there's there's a ton to go over, Eureka. So let's just jump in, actually. Let's go ahead and get started with it here. Because cool. last week, the Rowdies had two games. Two games. Oh, and yeah. uh, overall, actually, if you counted a seven-day period, it was three. But one of those was already covered. So we're going to go with the two. <laughs> Well, for, the first one was a loss versus uh, MLS side Houston Dynamo in the Open Cup, and we will talk about that. It was 1-0, although I would say it was a lot closer than you might think. And then uh, yeah. the second one was a win. Our second win of the year in the league, uh, not our second win overall, but at least in the league. And this was a 1-0 win versus Detroit City. So I will take that, obviously. For the RBLR Rowdies Cup standings, the guest spot has jumped out to – First place with five points. So well done to all of our guests who have put in uh, predictions so far. Hopefully you guys can yeah. keep that up and see where you end up at the end of the year. Carlos and myself sit on four. And Eureka, I got to say it, unfortunately, you are down at the bottom on one point. Yeah, I, I got to turn this around. I got to turn this around. I think I think this would be a good week to do that. But uh, much like the Rowdies, I think it's been an underperformance that I'm looking. And I, I have all the mentality in the world. I think we're going to pull this out in the end. There we go. I like good that, on, and I good like on the way you, you tagged good on it back. Your family, your family's come through in that guest spot uh, this year, so good, for, good for them. They have actually, yeah. My sister got that result exactly right. So, well done to Sam Smith. Um, to move on, then we have another week's game to preview here. So on Saturday, the Rowdies host Phoenix Rising. Please stay tuned to the end of our episode for our preview. Yep. And uh, obviously, we will also have an article out later on this week related to that to preview it again. And finally, before we get into it, I want to say RBLR is hosting our first ever watch party. That is coming up on May 20th at Berry House, located off the strip in Ebor. So if you would like to take advantage of some free beer giveaways, some halftime swag giveaways, beer pitcher specials all night, then please do join us for that. Uh, obviously you can see that we will have a pregame show as well. And, uh, yeah, we are going to be watching the Rowdies play RGV Toros. There is a lot of buzz online, at least as far as we can see here at RBLR sports. And we would like to make sure that there's even more buzz and there are even more people that show up to take part. So yeah, all of that now out Dude. of the way, Eureka, if you could take us through the quick recap for Houston Dynamo, no. I'll do Detroit city. And then we'll both do the questions. Yeah, Houston, uh, which was the first time an MLS team had played at Al Lang in a long, long time. Uh, in net was uh, Connor Sparrow. Then you had Dalgard, Antley, Lasso, Guillen, Tate Johnson getting the start, uh, Doherty, Ekra, Dennis, JJ Williams getting the start, and Felix Schroeder uh, uh, up in the top attacking. Game was. Uh, you know, it's pretty precarious for the Rowdies. Uh, then they, they settled into it, and um, really, we'll, we'll get into it a little deeper, but uh, it was pretty evenly matched, all, all told, uh, except for one mistake, and that mistake led to Houston scoring a goal on a, on a breakaway chance. Um, and, unfortunately, uh, 90 minutes wasn't enough. They couldn't muster the comeback, at, be, because if it was 110 minutes, they probably would have got one in the net, uh, all, all told, so... Uh, that's the quick way of saying it. We'll get into it a little bit deeper. Exactly. And now to do the same for Detroit City, we will go through the lineup and then move on. So in net was Connor Sparrow. Up in front of him were Connor Antley, Freddie Kleeman, Forrest Lasso, and Aaron Gian. In front of them were uh, Zach Harivo and Jordan Doherty to start with Dayon Harris, 
Charlie Dennis, Ryan Spaulding, and J.J. Williams up top. So that was the starting 11 there. Yet again, the Rowdies had a lot of chances in this game, just like Eureka was referring to in the Houston game. However, uh, we really couldn't put it away until late in the second half. It kind of looked like another game where the Rowdies might drop points. But luckily, we were awarded a penalty for what I thought was a pretty obvious handball, pretty clear decision for the referee to make, luckily. And that penalty was put in by Charlie Dennis. So... He had looked very dangerous all game, and ultimately he was able to put one in the back of the net. We obviously appreciate him for doing that because it was definitely looking like it was going to be one of those where the Rowdies fans were all upset afterwards despite a pretty good performance in the end. Now, uh, Eureka, let's get into the questions and analysis here. And um, tell me just for the Houston game, you know, how it went for you. What did you see out there? And then we'll try and break it down tactically as well. Yeah, you know, looking at the the 11, I, I didn't really want to call it rotating, but this was some players that started the season in maybe our, uh, disappointing fashion, results-wise mostly, and they made returns in the lineup. I mean, you saw Forrest Lasso, you know, with his newborn baby. Congratulations to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was making his first start relative, like, relatively quickly after that baby has been born. Uh, J.J. Williams back in the starting lineup there having Dalgard in the wing and Tate Johnson getting the start. So uh, Tate being a kind of a surprise starter with, with the rest of these guys kind of getting slotted back into the 11. I think that was the, the first thing that I, that I noticed. What were your thoughts on that before I, I move forward? Yeah, no, I, I did like that Tate was getting out there. As you said, I think that that is a bit of a rotational spot, maybe not, you know, what we're used to seeing in the league every week, but yeah. I think that Tate also deserves his chances here. Um, if he does get a chance to play in the league, then I'm not going to, you know, be upset about that by any means. Um, unfortunately though, I did see that possibly his youth came back to bite the rowdies. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, go, go ahead with what you were going to say and then we'll continue down with the tactics because, um, I did think that it was good to see him out there, but maybe a little problem. Yeah, I, 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 we'll, we'll get to Tate in a minute, but, but overall, I think that the Rowdies didn't play scared. Uh, Houston right. was rotating their themselves. Like, let's, let's be honest. They didn't bring like their fully formed uh, squad at yeah. Tao Lang. Um, but, but uh, Houston gave us problems, but the Rowdies weren't scared the, at the entire time. I mean, I guess early on the set piece defending was was lackluster positioning was a bit wonky on that and and Houston had quite a few chances very early yes um but it, it, in the second half the rowdies earned the possession although they were pushed back by the dynamo defense and um really did just come down to that one mis- like all like after everything i think it was a it, effort was not the, the the problem there it was just too too little too late on the offensive side and you made one pretty bad mistake um but uh, before we get into Tate like what, what how did you feel about kind of the like I was talking about set piece defense uh, do you agree with that or did you see something different no um all of my notes for the first half I was actually doing the uh stats reporting for uh Opta but, um, you know, you have to kind of take your notes in between. And it was it was a little bit up and down. But what I saw, um, you know, for the game, it was it was definitely a, a rough start for the Rowdies, I would say. I think that you are absolutely dead on when it comes to the set pieces. Our defense there looks pretty bad at times. I thought that we were going to concede at least two of those. But obviously, they did not go in early in the half. So um, that was fine. And then the Rowdies kind of settled in they kind of got their rhythm a bit more is what it looked like like you said though they were not playing scared it was not like they were overawed by the occasion or anything like that i think that you know just like anybody you're happy to play the 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 uh, team above you because you want to kind of show them you have a chip on your shoulder all that kind of stuff so as long as you get past that first nervy bit which the rowdies ended up doing then you should be able to kind of get yourself going and maybe impose yourself on the game and they did for long stretches but yeah. The one thing that I noticed, um, unfortunately, with Tate Johnson pressing up as high as he was, there was uh, there were multiple occasions in the first half where I saw the Houston Dynamo right winger, Corey Baird. Um, mm-hmm. He was wide open, kind of hugging the touchline off of Aaron Guillen's shoulder. Now, Aaron Guillen was able, um, in most instances, to cover him because the passes out to Corey Baird actually didn't end up being that great. 
But ultimately, if you just keep leaving that space open, it's entirely possible that they're going to exploit it. And that's yeah. what happens. So, yeah. you know, after uh, one or two chances where Houston got the ball and they tried to get that ball quick out to Corey Baird and they whipped it, um, ultimately, the first two times were not so great. Yeah. The third one was the killer. And they actually found Corey Baird perfectly on a diagonal. And uh, it was right into space where Aaron Guillen could not quite get to in time. So Aaron Guillen naturally has to sprint over there. And he is, you know, covering uh, space as best he can. But, you know, when you are at a full sprint, that's you can't really be tactical. You just kind of have to go at him. So he ran at Corey Baird as fast as he could. And Corey Baird found the man that was in the space that Aaron Guillen had vacated. Good and pass. that was their goal scorer. And that was their goal from Brooklyn yeah. Reigns. So um, he had a pretty easy tap in. Ultimately, I think it was Tate Johnson who was closest to getting back to, uh, you know, put a tackle in on him. But that did not really help in the end. And Brooklyn Reigns probably had one of the easier finishes that he's had in his young career so far. Yeah. And good enough for him. But, yeah, I uh, asked Neil Collins about this one after the game. And he said that Tate Johnson did very well. And far be it for me to disagree. I think that Tate Johnson was... Uh, particularly good, especially on the attacking side. I thought that this is, yeah. you know, in, especially where Tate can kind of show how good he is. But that was something that the Rowdies needed to cover for either one way or another and kind of just didn't. I think that Tate should have either stepped back a lot more when the Rowdies gave up the ball and, um, you know, maybe he just wasn't quick enough to do it in all of those uh, in all of those instances where we saw that the potential problem was arising. Or if, you know, if you're going to tell Tate, hey, I want you to get forward, I want you to get into the attack a lot, then you need to have Aaron Guillen kind of come over and make sure that that space is covered. And if Guillen is going to step yeah. out there, then you need to have somebody, obviously, on the man who's in the middle. I believe that was Sebas Ferreira for Houston. And you need to make sure that somebody is marking him. And I think that would have been in that game, uh, Forrest Lasso. Yeah, Forrest Lasso or Connor Antley. But somebody should have been there to cover him. And unfortunately, with nobody being there, that yeah. left bared all the space that he needed. And yeah. we gave up the goal. But it, it, one thing I will say, Eureka, you know, that, that, uh, that half – Kind of went back and forth, back and forth. Houston yeah. got their goal. They took advantage of the of the chance that they were given. Sure. And that's what an MLS team is probably going to do. But we made some substitutions going into the second half. And yeah. things started to look better, especially in the final 10 minutes or so. The problem that the Rowdies had was not chance creation in this half. It was yeah. actually the finishing. We yeah. We created chances, but we didn't put them away. Yeah, I, I think uh, if you're flipping over to the offensive side, yeah, tons of chances. Tate, Tate Johnson is number one on my list there. Jan Ekra, I think, created a, a few chances from the top of the box. Connor Antley had quite a few good yeah. good opportunities at, at the goal. Um, we created a lot of corner kicks, but no actual shots on target until the second half. Um, you said the the – the subs were a big part. Yeah. When Jennings and Harris and Harrovo and Spalding all brought in for instant hustle is what I wrote in my notes because yeah. like, I mean, day on obviously is a, is an F one uh, race car brought to life and, you know, we definitely needed that. And, but I thought that Cal and Cal Jennings is a agent of chaos, right? He's easy. He's, he's all motor. Um, so again, and Spalding was making his. Uh, this was his first game, right? Or no, second game they played. Or no, I'm trying to remember. It, I think with, this with was three his games, debut game. This was the debut then. Yeah, because because there's notes on him for the Detroit game too. I think that he immediately came in and showed that he's a very uh, on, very good on ball. He's he wants to create from that wing. He's a true you know uh, winger in that in that instance for on the offensive side. We've We've always seen like the tough defense over these, the Neil Collins era. But this is a guy I think they brought in to make chances and create them. And of course, the last sub was Lucky M. Kasana, kind of uh, at at number at seventy seventh minute. I don't know if that was on purpose, but but he came in at the seventy seventh. And it, to be honest with you, James, we're sitting in that press box, and I'm like, it kind of felt like it was go time. It felt like. Uh, Louisville, or it felt like you know a, a lot of these instances where Lucky can come in and create instant offense, you know, over those next thirteen or so minutes. So, yeah, I, I, I at no point felt like the Rowdies were out of it. They were creating chances in the second on net, but just 
for one reason or another, whether it's a pass too long or a kick too wide or, uh, but there were, there were a couple instances where they were right one-on-one in front of the goal and just missed it. And yeah. Um, yeah. Finishing was the problem. Effort wasn't the problem. Tactics. I don't even, I think that tactically was a sound game plan. I think that they got what they wanted. They just didn't do anything with it. And I think that Houston wasn't, as big of a problem as maybe we thought they would be. Um, I was a little worried when they put one in the net at halftime. Uh, Antley, uh, um, uh, we talked to Guillen after this game. No. Antley. It was Antley. Yeah. So we talked to Antley after this game, and he's the one who brought up like, yeah, you know, we would have loved to have it nil-nil at halftime, kind of thinking, yeah, we can do this. We, we got a shot. And it's, it's deflating to get that goal at halftime. But they didn't falter. They came back. They pressed even harder and had a better offensive performance in the second half. So um, just we, we've talked about a lot of chance creation leading to nothing or, or possession that doesn't lead to chances is just empty. And it didn't feel like that in this game. This, no. this felt like a like a good performance, although the, the result wasn't what we want. Like even the post game, you know. Uh, it, it was kind of tough talking to Aaron Guillen after his 100th uh, appearance because they lost. And, I mean, he was just very, you know, not uh, not angry, but he was and not uh, – not he was just disappointed, you know. He was very – not crushed, but you could tell that, like, yeah, this is all nice, but, you know, moral victories and little cool accolades don't mean anything if you don't win. This felt a little different. This felt like they had something to prove and – um they went out and did it. I, I think that, that that was the overall feeling that I got. Yeah, and um, again, Neil Collins, after the game, you know, he said that it was unfortunate, the score, and, you know, that's obviously true. But he did mention that he felt that this was the team that he expected the Rowdies to play like. We looked like the old Rowdies was uh, roughly the phrasing. I don't yeah. have the exact phrasing. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, this was, you know, the way that we are supposed to play, so to speak. We uh, we did a lot of pressing. We created a lot of chances. And unfortunately, those chances weren't turned in. But, you know, I think that at least we have the chances because we didn't even have that step before. So I'll, right. honestly, I'll take it at this stage of the game. I will take it. We will be perfectly happy with that. Yeah. But, um, also, a quick correction: It was Ryan Spalding's second game because he okay. made okay. his debut against San Diego. But regardless, okay. um, yeah, he did look lively, yeah, and he has looked up pretty much like a live wire since he's come on down to yeah. uh, to the team. Well, that's uh, to move on, kind of uh, about like if there's anything else about this game that that we should talk about. It's like I think this came at a pivotal point, much like the Nona game. Neil was very very uh direct with us in the post game about you know that this team has been naive in time and chances and they need to look in the mirror and find out who they are and i think that neil looked those guys right in the eye in the locker room and asked them for more more intensity more yeah. everything and this was a, in a, a turning point to me because it did have that feeling it felt like the effort was there the intensity was there yeah, the chances didn't materialize, but I think everyone was proud of the Rowdies and the effort that they put on uh, on that Wednesday night. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's then move on to the Detroit City game, because I okay. think that they kind of work together in tandem like this. So yeah. the Rowdies did have that chance creation like we've been talking about. Of course, they did have all the pressing that I think the Rowdies are a little bit more known for for the past couple of years. Yeah. But um, the first two months of this season, let's say, I think the Rowdies were really missing that pressing. I think that we did not look good in our pressing. So they kind of pulled back actually against San Diego. Our pressing was, I don't know, not even there. Most of the time, <laughs> the game before that, I remember that we were just stagnant when we did not have the ball. We were kind of waiting for them to attack us. And you know, that's fair enough. You have to get your, t your pressing triggers sorted out. And if you don't have them sorted out, then, don't mess around with it because you could get yourself into a tough situation. Um, I think that they were a lot better in doing that in both of these games. And when it got to Detroit city, ultimately we were able to combine both our lots of chains creation and our, uh, and ultimately the pressing, but yeah, the, the chains creation, while we did not get a goal from open play, we did get a goal off of it. And that was yep. the only goal of the game. So, Hey, three points, you know, we take it where we can, do it. Yeah. but, um, I wanted to say for this game, I think that one of the better players out there were, 
uh, was Charlie Dennis and then both of his two wingers, Dayon Harris and Ryan Spaulding. I think that Charlie Dennis was pivotal in this game because uh, behind him, you had Zach Haravo and Jordan Doherty, as well as at different points, Jan Ekra. So, um, you know, that was kind of the, the midfield in the middle. Uh, we did not play with the usual three at the back, but we switched it up kind of to four at the back. You know, it's obviously a fluid system, but it was actually a bit of a four, two, three, one. And the 10 in the middle of those attacking three midfielders was Charlie Dennis. So yeah, he was very important. He was uh, effective with the ball at his feet and he was able to draw opposing defenders towards him, which then opened space up on the wings for both Ryan Spaulding and Deion Harris. I thought that both of them also did take pretty good advantage of that. Unfortunately, we need to have a little bit better of the, you know, final product when it comes to their crossing. And then yeah. obviously we definitely need to have a little bit better of the finishing when yeah. their crosses do, do get into the box. But yeah. Um, yeah, I really liked the way that all of that played out and Charlie Dennis's chance creation there uh, was really good. I think the fact that he took the penalty and scored it wasn't just like, you know, he's the, he's the guy to do it, but he was feeling himself that day in a, in a yeah. way, you know, I think that he was, he knew that he was capable of doing it. He deserved to get a goal that day based on everything that had come before it. Yeah. And I'm happy that he was actually the one on the score sheet. So good stuff, better at least, yeah. but you know, we could, we could use a bit more all around. I'm just going to say, Overall, that is an improvement. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, going through this game, both teams, I think, were very desperate for points uh, going into this. You had written in your in your preview article, uh, which are, these are very good every week. So, guys, if you're not at rblrsports.com or if you're not following us at RBLR Rowdies, like we put out uh, – James puts out these amazing uh, articles previewing both the, getting into tactics, getting into some things that – he might not be able to do here on the pod a little bit deeper, so they're worth it. But uh, I, you would you would mention that like you know they're both these teams at the time were cellar dwellers, man, and it's 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 hard to say that as a Rowdies fan with all the recent success. But I think both teams showed that they needed these points for an entire yeah. first half. Neither team could make anything happen. Neither team established a rhythm for the first twenty five minutes or so. And once the Rowdies settled in at around half an hour into the first, um, I think that that's when the chances started creating. Uh, but Detroit, this is what I was going to ask, is Detroit to me seemed like their response to that was to get physical, was to try to – like it, the, obviously I, I think we, we made some adjustments about 30 minutes in. We got a little quicker. We figured something out tactically. And – their difference was okay. Well, now we'll just try to get them to get a bunch of cards or or mess them up. Or uh, teams do that with us, though. Like f over the last couple of years, is I think that that's everyone's response is maybe they see that we're a bunch of hotheads, or maybe they see you know maybe because of our 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 gaffer that that you know that that kind of uh, fire is going to be in all of us, and if we just kind of throw an extra elbow or something, we can pull a card out of the rowdies, but. I don't think the Rowdies were phased at all with this physicality that Detroit was trying to pull up. It was really rough listening to the announcers um, whenever the sound did work on the ESPN Plus uh, broadcast. <laughs> um, I mean, these guys were talking that we're diving everywhere and like uh, we're just this simulation. And it was um, it was really rough to listen to, um, you know, where's Ryan Davis in my hour of need, uh, <laughs> please. But uh, that was my question is I was just going to say, what did you think? Like it took a time to settle in. Once we did settle in, I think we were looking better, but then they decided just to kind of kick us and, and, and put us on the ground after, you know, in the first half. Well, I got to say, I actually listened to the game on, or I didn't listen to the game. I watched the game on mute because uh, I was uh, up in Fort Walton beach for a wedding. And, uh, my roommate was taking a nap on the couch in the same room. So I was uh, trying not to <laughs> bother him while I was also taking my notes and everything. But, um, if they were complaining about the refereeing being poor, then, uh, I, I will say that is only payback for the game against Houston, because <laughs> as much as I was taking notes, I didn't for, get into uh, that. I have a whole thing on that. I didn't get into it though. I, <laughs> as much as I was taking notes for uh, an independent website during this game, there were 
uh, let's say multiple occasions where I had to stand up and yell, what the <laughs> hell are you doing, Mr. Referee? <laughs> Something to that effect. Let's leave it at that. But hey, if they're complaining, then fair enough. I will say with Detroit City, um, not that they have a history of this. I don't want to put it that way, but history, or, sorry, Detroit City is a team that, you know, they're not afraid to kind of put themselves in that situation. Yeah. I think they're a team that is known both on the field and off the field for having this edge. Hmm. And, you know, um, that that's 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 something that's good to have in the league. Like, you got to have a team that everybody like, man, I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to go play there. Like, that sucks. Sure. But um, sure. that's a good sure. thing to have in the league. But yeah. you can't kind of you can't complain about it afterwards because yeah. um, everybody knows that if you go to Detroit City, you're going to get hit and yeah. you're going to hear it and you're going to take it from the fans. So, sure. I mean. Kind of, kind of, uh, go pound sand with that is my response. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am, uh, none too sympathetic when it comes to that because I think yeah. that Detroit City have the reputation and it's not a bad rep. Well, I mean, if you look at it from their perspective, maybe it's a bad reputation, but I don't yeah. think it's a bad reputation. I don't think it's a bad thing for the league. I just think it is a thing. And I do think it's a thing that Detroit City is associated with. You see yeah. their fans online. I mean, geez, sure. you talk about like an edge. They are they are so ready to go and argue people. Like, if yeah. that's just online, oh, I'm ready know, for I, this video to get down liked uh, as soon as it gets put out. Yeah, yeah, seriously, <laughs> they're gonna like they'll that. flock over. Detroit like City that. is going to uh, Detroit City is going to downvote this one, and then they're going to downvote next week's when we do a preview of our home yeah. game versus. Well, as long as they subscribe on YouTube, I, they can hate away all they want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, I I don't know. That's not that's not something that I, I I'm gonna really give much heed to because I think that the team earned their chances. I think that they played very well. Yeah, and I think that you know Detroit City is unfortunately they're doing poorly, and that's not because they're like a bad team. They just don't have a lot of chance creation themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if it you know if you don't have much going your way you can also get a little frustrated and maybe that's what happens well let me let me clarify like it wasn't like they tackled us all over the the pitch or anything but there were moments that uh you know they were contested a, a little hard and um I, I overall i thought detroit played us really they played us like they needed the points they played us very hard and exactly it wasn't, i mean the exactly. rowdy it's not like we walked out of there with a 10 nothing victory i mean we, we got one on a pk and I think that's the result that was earned in, in this match. You know, um, again, uh, James, I'll, I'll, I'll say it to you about again, uh, chance creation, but no execution. Right. <laughs> so why, why do you think that was that was the case in this game? Yeah. So uh, if I'm not mistaken for this one, obviously uh, we have the we have the uh, lineups here, but J.J. Williams started up top and then yeah. we did have the substitutions that came on later. So. Um, you know, we kind of ran through all of the attackers that we're used to seeing for the Rowdies and yeah. they all had a chance. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that partially it's down to the Rowdies not really being used to being in that situation in a in a game. So, mm. so far this year, obviously, you, myself, Carlos, maybe every single person online has taken a moment at least to complain about how the Rowdies have not been able to create chances. So when you are actually given those chances, it's not, it's not the easiest to just turn the switch. And then you're like, Oh, okay. I remember what to do here. Like as a, as a striker, you're supposed to be able to do that. Sure. And mm -hmm. you know, with no disrespect meant, I mean, we're not talking about like, you know, we're not talking about the uh, Timo Werner's of the world. We're not talking about the Erling Hollands of the world who just earlier today set a, a new premier league record for goals. Yeah. But uh Yeah. You know, these are these are strikers who are uh, very good for the level that they're at. And um, I, I think that it will certainly come for all of them at certain points yeah. over the year. If not, you know, it, it will come uh, eventually and they will all be able to get going and go down that road. But, yeah. yeah, you need to be able to kind of be in a rhythm. It's it's a rhythm thing for for goal scoring. And um, if we haven't been in a rhythm to even give them the chances prior to this, then I don't know, you know, we can't be up at their throats the, the second that, you know, we finally do get some crosses into the box and nobody's yeah. on the end of it. Yeah. What I do kind of want to see at the, you know, at the end is we do as a team like to create a lot of crosses. We involve our wingbacks, Connor Antley and Sebastian Dalgard. 
we involve our wingers, Dayon Harris and Ryan Spaulding. So it doesn't matter what formation we're playing. We're going to have a lot of crosses coming into the box. That's something that we like to do. If we're going to do that, then we can't just rely on one guy to get on the end of these because obviously he's probably going to be marked by one person. They're probably going to have another person somewhere around there. And then, you know, maybe a midfielder is tracking back too. There, it, It's just more likely that the opposition team will have more of their own players in the box because I wasn't even counting the goalkeeper in that quick little demonstration there. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you want to get more people getting on the end of more crosses, then you need more people in the box for yeah. those crosses. So yeah. if Dayon Harris has it on the right yeah. side, I want J.J. Williams in the box. I want Ryan Spaulding on the back post. I want Charlie Dennis at the top of the box waiting for the ball to come loose and he takes a quick shot. Uh, opposite side. I want Ryan Spaulding crossing it in for JJ Williams and Dayon Harris. So, um, you know, I think that Lewis Hilton doesn't score frequently, but when he does score, when he's out there, um, he often scores balls that have fallen to him at the top of the box and he shoots from pretty far out. And these are balls that have come off of crosses where they got, you know, a quick clearance, but it wasn't a good clearance. So if we're not there to do that, then we're not going to have a lot of goals off of these crosses. And I'm pretty sure that's what the team is going to be working on. But it's unfortunate that we saw that happen kind of in both these games this week, as much as we had a lot more chances. We had a lot more good opportunities. We didn't put them in the best spots or we didn't put players in the right spots to get on the end of them. Yeah. I mean, looking at my notes about the offense, um, you know, no goals in open play. So, you know, I'm looking at these chances that we do get, or even if they weren't shots on goal, they were what I'm calling a chance. It, uh, fought mob might ag- agree in a different manner, but you know, it kind of took the, at the very beginning of the game. It took a great individual effort from Spalding to create and, and, and a good pass from JJ too to create the first big chance, which was across to day on Harris who had a one-on-one with Steinwasher and he went wide of the target. He just, he just couldn't put the boot on it. Yeah. Then it took a little bit later. It took I an remember almost that play. I was, I was uh, head in uh, hands. <laughs> yeah. No, so was he, I mean, uh, and it also took an almost perfect individual effort by J.J. Williams to head her in a long cross that came in from just inside mid-pitch line, and he hit it with his head, but it hits the woodwork. And, I mean, he beat Steinwasher. He just, like he beat him, and, and he got a great header, jumped up, used his size, but woulda, coulda, shoulda, just didn't. It was a, But that's an individual effort, again, we, you say we're uh, relying on crosses, of course. And in this game, a lot of shooting at the top of the box. There wasn't, they were not playing through the middle at all. There was no penetrating runs. I mean, Harris got stopped by Steinwasher again, almost on a perfect one on one top of the box shot right to Steinwasher. Charlie Dennis missed a wide open shot at the top of the box. And then when they did get in the box later on in the game, Dalgard and Williams kind of had a little miscommunication. They were trying a little give and go action, and um, uh, you know JJ was ready for it, and and Dalgard just fired it on you know towards the net, and and but Williams was like right there in the box, posted up, ready to go. I remember you know, that, that, that too. <laughs> he was like a target man right in there, you know. And um, Charlie Dennis. As much as he was the the one of the best players on the pitch, he got stopped one on one in the box versus Steinwasher. But you know, um, uh, so I, I mean, Steinwasher is a a, a, a a upper tier goalkeeper in this league. So I mean, if, if he if, if it was anybody else, we would have had probably three of those go in. Um, and there was one set piece or a corner. Antley had a really good chance off a corner on a back post, and but he, he just couldn't quite get the header on it. But but anyway, it's these just an inch away from putting six goals in the back of the net, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, so at this point, it doesn't feel bad. It feels like an uptick. It feels like they're doing something. But it's gonna be and this will be the story of the year if in a month or two we're still sitting kind of where we're at and we're talking about what could have been. Yeah, exactly. I think that, I think that that's exactly right. And I'm assuming without, you know, any, any extra knowledge, but my assumption is that will be the foot, the training of, uh, or the focus of the training that they do this week to make sure yeah. that they can get all of that stuff kind of nailed yeah, out. But is it, do you think it's, is it mental? I mean, I don't know. It's just like, is it just, that's the skill level of, of who's at this, 
who's in there, you know, that's like finishing, I think a, finishing is, a, is an art, you know, it's a skill. Yeah, yeah, and it is, but I think that at this point it's more of a mental thing. Like it's just, it's a thing that will come with more chances and more rhythm. Like if you, if you get that one, you're yeah. feeling a lot more confident and I'll tell you, it feels uh, like that right now. It yeah. Like even as a, to open up. Yeah. <laughs> even as a defender, you know, um, when I was growing up, if I was confident going into a tackle, there was a lot better of a chance that ultimately I came away with it. If yeah. I was like, Ooh, uh, how am I going to do this? Then either they were going to beat me or they were, uh, they were going to find somebody on the other side of me. That's, that's yeah. kind of how it went. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, I do remember that from growing up and that's, that's a, you know, a much worse level, of course, you know, just youth soccer. So, um, sure. if you, if you don't have the confidence at a much tougher level to score, then, you know, that's, that's going to inhibit you. But, um, yeah. that, that's, that's kind of where I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I think, I think they've improved. Um, I think this week was very tough. We were lamenting, uh, eight days, three games. How are we going to come out of this? And, um, I think that it was a, there was a, there was a bad loss, a good loss and a good win. Right. Or, uh, <laughs> And and I think we 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 feel better about this. At least I feel better about this team. Um, I guess if I had to break it down, I, I think defensively in open play they're just as good as advertised. Whether it's a three back or a four back, we keep other teams down. We've posted clean sheets now. We've 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 done the job when it's when it's needed. Um, set pieces are the only question so far. It was shaky versus Houston. It was shaky versus Detroit again. We haven't really gotten into that, but. I thought our set piece, the the chances that Detroit was able to make in set pieces, um, we just didn't have, uh, but they didn't have enough opportunities to really um, prove that they were like super shut down in, against Detroit. Detroit had a few set pieces. It's kind of inconclusive, I guess, is what I should I should amend my statement to say about that. Um, so that's something I will be looking for is how we defend set pieces. Yeah. Um, but over a bigger thing though, is I think that in terms of building chemistry, that's going to lead to a six goal offensive output. I don't think we're there yet. I think there's still so much to figure out. We would, without having dynamic playmakers or a physical presence in the box, I, I see chances. I see glimmers. I see glimpses, but there isn't someone that I'm like, yes, we're going to stick J.J. Williams in the middle of that box, and he is our target man. Boom. Yes. Oh, my God. You know, uh, Spalding is just going to be this dynamic playmaker from the wing. There are glimpses, but those are hypotheses right now that haven't been borne out. Um, uh, but before I go uh, any further, I, I've been talking too much. So, James, like, yeah, how do you feel about that? Like, um, I, I was kind of talking about, you know, defensively i think they're good in open field set pieces whatever but it's just there's like a gelling on offense that still hasn't really happened here yeah no i i still think that um we haven't really figured out all the best ways to put these players together yeah. and that is what happens in a year where you get a lot of turnover unfortunately you know we lost sebastian guanzotti Stephen dos santos now we didn't mean to or yeah. whatever but leo fernandez is out so you consider right. all of these pieces Right. Um, Ryan Spalding has come in, you know, a couple games into the season. You kind of have to put all of these guys together and you have to find the way that works for all of them to play together. But yes. if they aren't like on the same page yet and they don't know, they don't know the proper passing uh, patterns to unlock each other really is kind of what yeah. it is. Then yeah, there's going to be trouble and that'll come the more that they play together. But um, you know, I guess that honestly, the off season just wasn't long enough. You know, yeah. that's kind of how I look at it. We needed yeah. more time to make sure that these guys were all playing together on the level that we needed. And um, well, if, yeah. if you can't really work that way at the USL level, because you're bringing in guys relatively late, um, then that's just how it goes. Yeah, I was going to wrap up by saying like, uh, uh, yeah, on this subject is like, but, but there's a marked shift in the attitude and the intensity and the mindset of this team yes. that we've seen this week. Look, you and I and everyone had very high expectations for this season. And there, I don't know if it's taking excellence for granted in the beginning of the season or something. There just, there just wasn't that spark. There wasn't that fire uh, to be honest with you. And 
look, they could they could rest their laurels on on uh, you know oh we're, we've overcome a lot of these um, little nagging things, whether it's visas or injuries or coaching suspensions or bad refereeing or oh last second mishaps, you know uh, that well we had three points until we didn't, you know we had a clean sheet at halftime until we didn't, like these little things that they could say oh you know when we just have all this bad stuff against us but they haven't like antley gian schroeder neil and everyone that we've talked to uh after the matches they seem that they're holding themselves accountable they're moving forward they did look in the mirror when when neil asked them to and they kind of seem like right now they're ready to reset and ready to move forward in a positive direction. So with all that, that's encouraging it, yeah. as much as that we've been dogging uh, the defense or the set pieces or whatever. There's this little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, a gleam in people's eye right now in that locker room that they know that they've been underperforming and they know that they're this close to figuring it out. And, and a few weeks ago, it kind of felt like those might've been empty words from a coach or a player, but right now I believe it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, but all right, Eureka, I think at this point we got to do our man of the match. So let's start with okay. Houston. Who was yep. your man of the match for that game? Yeah, for Houston, it was Jan Ekra. Um, uh, Jan did all the little things, I think, really well against that Houston. Look, if he doesn't hold down that midfield the way that he normally does, I mean, we're, we're the Jan Ekra fan club here at RBLR. Um, I think I'm just going to redo the logo that just says like Y A double N at some point. <laughs> um, but look, what what can we say about this guy? Look, it's it's leadership, it's uh, just the poise that he has. But then he is also going toe to toe with the MLS guys in this match, and I absolutely thought that he he brought the level of professionality that that they needed at that time. All right, and mine was Connor Antley. I think that Connor Antley was heavily involved in the attack, and he did very well defensively. Um, You know, it wasn't down his side that any of those chances ultimately were created for Houston. But more importantly, like I said, he was heavily involved in the attack and all of that chance creation that unfortunately came to naught, but I don't think that that was mostly down to him. I think that he was putting it into good positions. Uh, Unfortunately, we just couldn't really get anybody on the end of it who was able to then put it in. So He's been really good. I I have really liked Connor Antley's uh, play the last couple of games. I was considering (laughs) him for my man of the match for Detroit, but ultimately I did not go with that. So um, let's go to the Detroit game then. And Eureka, who was your man of the match for that one? I'll say so this is on a curve because I think we both agree that that Charlie Dennis was the best man on the pitch. Um, but uh, we were, I was saying off air that like he was the best guy on the pitch. But but personally, the guy that stood out the most to me was J.J. Williams. J.J. Williams, I think, took a, a big leap forward in, in my eyes and, and hopefully Neil's because uh, he created the pass that made the best chance in the first half. He mm-hmm. he should have scored that goal, the header to the post. He dispossessed people in the middle of the field. He created counter chances. Like he was making all the little things that I love to see, like a Hilton make or whatever. But he's he's a he was doing it defensively and creating offensively, and like he was grinding it out. And I, I, kudos to to Williams, man. I think he killed it. I think he did a great job. All right, my man of the match for that game. Uh, actually, it was Ryan Spaulding. So similar to what you said, uh, J.J. Williams was heavily involved in the attack. So was Ryan Spaulding. I think that he actually had a very good game and he might turn out to be a very good signing for us. But um, yeah, he showed a lot of good like ideas. He had a lot. He has a lot of good ideas. And yeah. I think that he's going to eventually turn into one of the guys who gets a lot of assists on this team. He hasn't just yet, but I'm sure that we will get to a point in the season where that is the case. So yeah. um, this was just a small taste of what he can do. Yeah. All right. Now with that, we're going to just make a note here that liking and subscribing to our podcast is free. And we, of course, appreciate when you do that. But if you think you might need some new clothes coming up this year, we would like to help you out. And you could help us out just that little bit more by heading over to shop.rblrsports.com and checking out all of the designs that we've got there. As you can see, Eureka is holding one up, but uh, if you would like to take 10% off your order, we will have the promo code COYR. Or come on, you rowdies, and you can get 10% off your final order. But please do check it out because as Eureka was just holding up those shirts, I think that you will find something you like in there if you check it out. Now, 
Um, Eureka, we have a game this Saturday versus yes, Phoenix Rising. Uh, yes, we this do. It's going to be a big one. Yes, we do. So, uh, yeah, you you tell me. Uh, like with with, with Phoenix, um, they are coming in this Saturday at Al Lang, and it's headband day as a guy with long hair, and we have like five guys now on the team that all like have long hair and I, like this it's decades night it's 70s night it i'm there's going to be so many cool costumes that ralph's mob and skyway casuals and everyone's going to be going to be in um it's already kind of a party every weekend anyway at Owlang, but the, i think the fans are going to be here it's phoenix which you know, it hasn't exactly been the peak of a couple of years ago, but Phoenix is an is a name that I think a lot of Rowdy's fans will get excited to play. Uh, they're a Western Conference foe, so we we've only seen them sporadically, but now we're right. going to play them twice. And uh, and they're both teams are kind of in the same kind of the same headspace right now. I think that both teams kind of feel like they're underperforming. And, uh, yeah, how do you feel about uh, Phoenix so far? Well, uh, honestly, this is a game that could go either way, and I think that it comes at a really good time for us now. We're, you know, on the slightest little up curve, and I would like us to kind of get that, you know, Detroit City, all, all, all due respect, they are obviously having a very tough year. Yeah. And... Phoenix are in the middle of kind of a similar thing to what we're doing. Um, you know, we'll go over all of this in a bit here, but they are in the middle of a rebuild themselves. So they are kind of in the process of putting all those pieces together in a way that works and actually clicks. We are not there yet on our side. I don't think they're yet on their side, but there is so much talent and so much potential for both mm -hmm. teams that I think that with us on that slightest little uptick, it's going yeah. to be very important that we are able to actually make this a thing and, and like overcome a very good opponent who might also just be in a tough spot at yeah. the moment. And yeah. that will give us a lot more momentum. So let's get into it here a little bit more yeah. on Saturday at seven 30, the Rowdies will host Phoenix rising. As you said, at Alang stadium, please do show up for all of that and all of the things that Eureka just went over in his segment phoenix like the rowdies are seventh in their conference however they have 10 points to our seven they have two wins four draws and one loss so that's where they differ with us and uh their home wins were uh i'm sorry they have one home win versus Loudoun united and they have one away win versus birmingham legion so that's a very kind of kind of an odd uh an odd grouping but uh you know fair enough both of them were against uh eastern conference teams now, Juan Guerra, a former Rowdy, if no one uh, remembers him, then please do check him out online. He is a very good former player, and uh, now it seems to be quite a good coach. But, uh, yeah, he has them lining up in kind of a 3-5-2 to a uh, 4-4-2. It will mold over the course of the game depending on who's out there and, you know, obviously game situations. That is how yeah. soccer works. Everything has got to be fluid. But they do like to start roughly in a 3-5-2 situation. And uh, that lineup usually goes Rocco Rios, Novo in net. And we're going to talk about him a little bit more. Kevin Lambert in front of him, along with Daniel Crutzen and either Mohamed Traore and, or, or Alejandro Fuenmayor is what it's been so far. Mm -hmm. Then in the midfield, they will have uh, Henry Uzuchukwo, a uh, Nigerian right back, right winger. Um, he is looking, you know, very, very interesting out there. Uh, Renzo Sombrano, Carlos Harvey, and uh, kind of Erickson Gallardo on the left, although he will step up a lot more into the attack. And mm -hmm. then up top, they have often gone with Fede Varela, Manuel Arteaga, and uh, either Jackson Conway or uh, Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo is the one that we will most likely see up top for Phoenix this coming yeah. weekend. So uh, Phoenix also has a lot of depth on their team. Obviously, I named Jackson Conway as a player who was up against Danny Trejo. But they have a lot of other players that have started so far this year, including Jose Hernandez, who has been all throughout the USL for several years, Gabriel Torres, who has been all throughout the USL for several years, and just a couple of others along the way. But uh, last week, Carlos Harvey was serving a suspension. He should be back against the Tampa Bay Rowdies, and that will, you know, obviously <laughs> cause a lot of problems in our midfield, I imagine, but hopefully we'll be able to overcome them. So uh, the way that they kind of line up it creates chances for 
Uh, their players up top, obviously, and those are Danny Trejo and Manuel Arteaga. Each of them have three goals each, or yeah, each of them have three goals, while uh, Gabriel Torres, Henry Uzuchuku, and Manuel Arteaga as well have two assists each. So that is kind of the way that they have played out on that sense. And uh, we're going to have a full tactical breakdown in the preview article, but just to get into it a little bit more here. Um, Henry Uzuchuku is a very interesting player. He seems like a player who's almost too fast for his control of the ball at times. Um, like he, he wants to go at the speed of light, but the ball isn't always coming with him. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, Carlos Arvey, with him returning from his suspension, it will likely be him and Renzo Sombrano in the midfield. Mm -hmm. And if those two sit in the midfield in front of the defensive line, then that usually allows uh, the Argentine number 10, Fede Varela, to kind of go wherever the hell he wants. Uh, he's a little bit like Leo Fernandez was in his 2022 MVP season, where he was just allowed to go wherever he wanted, wherever the ball was going to be. And mm -hmm. uh, he does it to good effect. He's a player that they signed from the Bulgarian first division. And um, yeah, I, I watched uh, the first half of Phoenix versus Loudon. And then I wanted to switch things up. So I watched the first half of Phoenix versus San Diego to get like some some uh, pre preparation for this game. And yeah. I'll tell you, watching eight, San Antonio is a very good team. <laughs> the fact that they won last year is no surprise and that they've gotten even better this year is kind of scary. But um, no. between San Diego's Argentine number 10 and Phoenix's Argentine number 10, uh, Christian Pirano and then Fede Varela for Phoenix. Like I just love the very stereotypical and quintessential Argentinian number 10. They're so good with the ball at their feet. They're, uh, you know, generally shorter players. And, um, you know, it, it's just, they're, they're just so like uh, the way that they can hold the ball, but on the move and keep players off and on their shoulders. So they can't reach <laughs> the ball. It's crazy. It's, yeah. it's honestly crazy. It reminds me of a certain Argentinian number 10 who uh, may or may not have won a world cup in the last couple of months, but maybe not quite at that level. So let's just, <laughs> let's just cut that off right at the pass. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I expect Fede Varela will obviously be heavily involved in all of their attacks. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is Erickson Gallardo is another very skillful player. He will often play more so as a left winger as opposed to the you know left wing back. I yeah. think that the left-sided defender, whether that's Mohamed Traore or uh, one of the other two out there, which will be Daniel Crutzen or Alejandro Fuenmayor, they will kind of push into the left back spot so that Gallardo can kind of get up the wing as a very traditional number uh, number seven winger. But he's another player that we're going to have to defend very good in 1v1 situations, honestly. I think that Phoenix rely a lot on individual brilliance to try and get past people. That's going to be, again, Varela and Uzuchuku and Erickson Gallardo. And Manuel Arteaga is the one who has benefited from a lot of these chances so far. He's got a very good finish, so we're going to have to keep an eye out on all of those different things. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I definitely think that both teams feel like if just a couple things went a little differently. I mean, you're looking at Phoenix with four draws where, I mean, that that's how they play. That I think their record definitely shows the team they are, man. They're, they're able to pull out amazing wins. Um, they're not going to lose a lot and it's going to be tough to, to overcome them. Uh, and, it, but, but if you take it to them, I think that there are, there are a few weaknesses and things like that, but pretty balanced team. Um, but all in all, I, I think that um, I'm kind of confident with this matchup. I, I'm feeling I'm feeling the rowdies are. On, I don't want to get. I don't know if you want to get to predictions yet, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm excited. Just, I, I think I think it. it's gonna be a good one. Um, all right, well, Eureka, yeah. you lead us off and tell us what your prediction here is gonna be. Yeah, with all that said, um, I I think that Phoenix can score on the road. They they've shown that, and but this rowdies defense right now, I think, is gonna prove to be stifling at Al Lang. Uh, meanwhile, the rising, like I said, I think they've been arguably underperforming all season and, and they, they squeak out nail biters. So it, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be surprising if they score on the road, but, um, as much as I don't think it's going to be a clean sheet, I think it's gonna be very close. And I have the rowdies getting the three points they so desperately need right now two one rowdies. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I do feel like you said that they're probably going to score. So my prediction for this game was going to be a 1-1 draw. 
And yep. then uh, I will leave it to you to go through the yep. whole uh, guest spot because we have we have a good little paragraph here. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to get Carlos's prediction. We didn't get his. Uh, he's off on assignment right now, but I got to get his, uh, his his prediction. But we did get a prediction from our good friend, Brian, from Rowdy's Observer. That's at Rowdy's Observer on Twitter. Please, please, please follow him. Uh, he's fun. He does the three pints after every win. And uh, he wrote us here. He says, uh, you know, the Rowdies have started out with a pretty tough schedule if you really break it down. And the same goes for Phoenix. Obviously, the Rowdies have had serious issues putting the ball in the old onion bag while Phoenix has scored in most games this season. This is an interesting matchup, but the Owl Lang Ralph's mom factor makes this a one to nothing type game for the Rowdies. But who's going to score that goal is anyone's guess. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, I, I actually really like that take because, you know, it's all very plausible. Um, unfortunately, games can kind of go haywire, but uh, I, I think that on paper, this is definitely, uh, you know, I, I tend to agree. I'm just leaning towards the 1v1 for that that gut feeling that I've mentioned mm. a couple of times. You're so. pragmatic with these draws, buddy. And I don't know. <laughs> I need to, I, maybe I need to, to, to get on your level, but, but I need to, I, I got to, I need the Rowdies to get me these points to move me up in our RBLR cup. So come that's on right. Around. That's right. <laughs> um, all right, Eureka, do you want to do our extra, extra time segment? And then we will close this one out. Oh, oh yeah. So let, let me move this over here. Okay, guys, uh, we hyped it up in the beginning, but this is the most ambitious thing that we have ever planned for this, uh, th this awesome thing that we try to do for you guys. We're putting together this Tampa side Row Rowdy's watch party. We, I know we've been trying to get a Tampa side watch party going for, for a number of years now, and we've got one. We're trying to do this at Berry House Brewery. Guys, what do you want? Free beer? We got it. Halftime swag, T-shirts. Uh, we'll be giving away stuff from the RBLR shop. Um, there's beer pitcher specials. And by the way, it's gold medal winning beer. It's like the best beer that I've had in a long time in Tampa Bay. They're a, uh, they're a really good company. They've got a big nice spaces area for us to watch the game and uh we'll we'll we will even be doing our first ever live pre-game show before the game so it's like it's big for us it's big for the 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 brewery but most importantly it's going to be a fun time for you so what do you want good beer the green and gold rblr i hope you love all those three things because that's what we're going to give you on may 20th as we uh we beat the pants off the rgv toros so that's my spiel. <laughs> All right. I love that folks. You got to show up. I mean, you, for that spiel, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> but, um, all right, that will do it for us tonight. Thank you, Eureka, for filling in for Carlos. And we yeah. will, uh, you know, see how this game goes, but I, I do like the way that we ended it. And I do love the, uh, the predictions that came out of it. So please follow RBLR sports on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. We are at RBLR sports. I am also on Twitter at RBLR James K. And what about you, Eureka? Uh, it's right down there at the bottom at Eureka RBLR on your social media thing. So yeah, come, come see right now. I am feverishly tweeting whenever there's a nuggets game in the NBA because the nuggets and the rightful MVP Nikola Jokic uh, are right now two games up on the Phoenix suns. And we are ever so close to that, getting that final step. Let's go. All right, there you go. And if you have any questions for us, please use the hashtag AskRBLR. Obviously, we are very happy to take those whenever you have them. Now, uh, please, of course, if you've gotten this far, we assume you have. But if you haven't or if you want anyone else to, like and subscribe to the show. And uh, you can get the full experience now on YouTube. Obviously, we are here. We are ready to uh, take all of your comments, even if you have any comments on, you know, our, our faces, what they look like, what they should look like, <laughs> anything like that. But yeah, please get the full experience on YouTube. Otherwise, we are on Apple and Google Podcasts and, uh, you know, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever podcasts are, we are too. So for another week closer to the RBLR watch party, come on, you rowdies. Come on, you rowdies.
Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.